second session about functional materials and devices. The first speaker is invited from Material X, industrial uh, speaker, Otello Roscioni, talking about accurate multi scale simulation of advanced material. Otello, we are looking forward to hear your talk, and without any hesitation, uh, let's just start sharing the screen. Let's go. Well, thanks, Marco, for uh, the kind introduction and the organizing committee for inviting me and you, the audience, uh, for attending this session. So um, hopefully uh, by uh, the end of this talk, uh, you will see how to turn uh, molecules into fancy uh, jelly beans uh, uh, objects such as uh, those shown in this cartoon. So uh, let me start with a bit of history. Um, in the early day of uh, molecular modeling, um, molecules were represented uh, with a single object, and that was due to um, uh, limitation in computing power. So here I'm showing this nice series of studies by uh, Professor Zanoni at the University of Bologna and Professor Lackhurst at the University of Southampton. I happened to uh, graduate, um, uh, to earn my PhD in Southampton, and I had a postdoc uh, in Bologna, so I was like um, in the middle of this uh, work. Um, so uh, the nice thing about these models is that despite that simplicity, so here we talk about um, a single object uh, characterized by this shape and strength of uh, interactions. Uh, well, um, um, the, well, despite this simplicity, and the fact that uh, we operate in a dimensionless uh, space where the energy and, and time are measured in these um, uh, Leonard Jones units, uh, yet uh, we observe a rich uh, phase behavior uh, depending on the relative strength of uh, these interactions. So we start from 2D uh, lattice models, uh, then we move to um, 3D uh, simulations uh, in the 90s, and then uh, by the 2000s, uh, we, uh, well, they uh, used uh, um, uh, ellipsoids uh, and uh, generalized Gaburn uh, potential. So uh, forward 20 years, I entered this picture uh, and um, uh, in a European project, we were um, asked, asked to um, develop a, um, a multi-scale model for organic semiconductors. So after um, um, a lot of headaches, uh, we ended up with this MOLC uh, model and in a nutshell uh, we replace um, a, a molecule such as the one you see here uh, with a simplified uh, coarse grain model where we use ellipsoids but this time they are connected so they overlap in space uh, um, and the main feature is that um, the excluded volume in other words the shape of the molecule is reproduced uh, very accurately and this is reflected uh, in the density so you see here two amorphous samples. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, the uh, all atom structure, and on the uh, right-hand side, um, the coarse grain structure. So you see a very nice agreement in terms of um, density. Uh, in this plot, I show the, um, uh, the angle between the phen uh, phenyl and naphtyl um, residues um, in this molecule. So you see, um, the reference gas phase value of uh, the vertical line. Um, then uh, the um, red line is the reference for um, the um, condensed phase structure, and this from all atom molecular dynamic simulations. The MOLC model, so our coarse grain model, is this uh, black curve. So there's a few degrees of difference that magnify because the scale is in um, cosine beta. So there's color product of this axis, the Z axis on this uh, cartoon. Um, and another uh, important point is this reverse map atomic structure, which is basically we convert um, the coarse grain structure back to the atomic structure. We relax at room temperature and we uh, recover basically um, the same uh, distribution of the reference model. Um, um, so still for the same um, sample, here we have um, the uh, radial distribution functions showing how the uh, amorphous structure is organized. Um, so you see many coordination shells. And again, the important feature set is that um, uh, 
the uh, red curve is the reference, the uh, atomic simulation, and is computed between uh, fragments uh, of the molecule. So we look at the center of mass, for instance, between the two uh, biphenyl units in the molecule or the external naphthyl or phenyl uh, substituents. And uh, we see a very nice agreement with the uh, between the coarse grain model and the um, all atom uh, reference. And again, uh, the reverse map structures basically uh, identical to the um, uh, all atom reference. I should stress that these two samples, the all atom and the MO LC, uh, have different thermal history, while the reverse map is related to the MOLC. So if you want, it's, it's connected. Um, since we use a, um, a coarse grain model, the idea is to go big and to run mesoscale simulations. So in this case, um, I show you uh, here a, sem a large sample of 216,000 molecules. Um, so that corresponds to a bit more than a million ellipsoids. And uh, we end up with a cube of 60 uh, nanometers uh, per side. So we can analyze this huge assembly of molecules, uh, identifying clusters where um, uh, the pi pi systems are um, interacting uh, more strongly. So in this example, in this small uh, cluster, uh, we look at um, superposition between, um, well, partial overlap between the biphenyl uh, um, uh, moieties of um, the alpha and PD molecule. And we can connect all these clusters and uh, highlight a percolation pathways. So in other words, uh, we show where uh, the electric charge flows uh, in these kind of amorphous uh, semiconductors. Well, now uh, let me show you a practical example of a multi-scale simulation. So let's start with a single molecule in gas phase. So it has many degrees of freedom when we look at the uh, atomic structure. And the basic idea on, uh, on a coarse grain model and the MOLC in particular is to replace uh, fragments, uh, um, relatively rigid fragments of this molecule with ellipsoids. So those are connected and we keep some um, uh, uh, internal degrees of freedom. So you see uh, the model is fully flexible and uh, we can use it uh, then to build a um, coarse grain sample. And since intermolecular interactions are included uh, uh, very accurately, I will give more details later, uh, we obtain, obtain very realistic uh, condensed phase structure. Um, so much so that uh, we can then reverse map and introduce uh, the atomic structure back into this model and run a multi-scale simulation where um, uh, we basically do not lose information about um, uh, the properties, uh, the structural organization of this sample. And that's demonstrated by the smooth transition between the two uh, models. Um, so a bit more details uh, very quickly. So on the top, uh, you see the uh, general expression for the uh, internal energy. So in other words, um, the force field uh, uh, at the base of the MOLC model. Uh, the first two terms are um, intermolecular um, um, uh, interactions, so pairwise, and then we have a bonded term. So uh, the first ingredient is for short range interactions, we use a gay burn potential, uh, which is essentially a um, generalized version of the uh, Lennard-John potential, but for uh, ellipsoids or spheroids, so uh, uh, anisotropic objects. That we include uh, the uh, long range electrostatic interactions with via uh, uh, point charges, um, except that uh, we define these charges in the molecular uh, frame of reference of each ellipsoid. So in other words, um, uh, we decorate each ellipsoid with virtual charges, uh, and then we make the usual um, uh, summation in, in the real space plus a long range solver uh, for uh, the electrostatic interactions. And the last um, bit, is the bonded potential. So this is an effective two-body potential which uses uh, um, 
the vector uh, radius connecting the two centers of uh, two bonded ellipsoids plus the scalar products between the uh, three axes of each object. So those ellipsoids are um, uh, rigid bodies, so they have six degrees of freedom, uh, and uh, therefore they are represented with two quaternions uh, describing the orientation. And just to give you a, a, an example on um, a potential that you may recognize as the torsional potential for uh, alkyls, um, so here I show um, the uh, potential uh, computed for uh, the rotation around this bond for butane. And the, what is uh, represented here is the scalar product of um, the Z axis. So the blue arrows uh, in this cartoon. And so uh, for the Stargard configuration, so you see here the Newman representation, we have that uh, the scalar product is minus one, that corresponds to the uh, cosine of the beta angle. Um, then we have, as we rotate around this bond, we have a maximum and minimum and another maximum corresponding to the uh, eclipse uh, configuration. Of course, the scalar product is defined only in the between minus one and one. So that's the, uh, the gray area and that's what is sampled in the, um, in the simulations. But uh, for, well, to give a physical meaning here is extended uh, to uh, two pi, which is a full rotation. Um, well, just to uh, summarize on uh, the MOLC model, uh, it's based on a bottom-up parametrization. We include electrostatics, and they are similar to those uh, used for uh, type 1 force field, uh, so they're based on ab initio calculations. Uh, we parameterize the gay burn parameters and the bonded potential using uh, the gromos all atom force field as a reference. And the main characteristics is that it's, uh, it's a fast and very accurate from a structure point of view um, force field. Uh, it allows a seamless conversion between atomic and coarse grain representation as demonstrated in this cartoon and is based on open source software. So LAMPS uh, for, as a, a molecular dynamic engine plus molten plate to store um, the force field information. Um, here, a simple example. Of, uh, this is a work on water models done in collaboration with Francesco Bellucci and Matteo Fasano from the University of uh, Polytechnic of Turin, Italy. So um, in this cartoon, you see um, a classic uh, water model, rigid water model, model with three atoms. Uh, there's one Leonard John center on the oxygen atom, and there's this dotted line, uh, three point charges and point masses and everything is kept rigid with uh, uh, the shake algorithm. Um, and for the MOLC model, we have a, a single finite size Leonard John sphere uh, decorated with three massless charges. And uh, um, the, I would say the, uh, the, the first difference is that it has a larger uh, inertial tensor compared to the, um, to the atomic model. Um, so um, for the MD simulation, we use typically a time step of two femtoseconds for rigid water models, but for the cross grain model, we can go up to 10 femtoseconds. Um, I shall say that um, mathematically speaking, we have the same energy and forces if we take the same configuration and slightly different torques. That's because um, on the atomic model, the, um, uh, the center of mass is slightly offset uh, uh, compared to the geometrical center of the system, th which is this uh, cross. Um, so uh, the, um, the, um, the consequence uh, of this difference in the inertia tensor is that we have a slightly higher viscosity. So here we compare on the x-axis uh, the viscosity computed for the atomic uh, simulations and on the y, uh, uh, y axis the coarse grain uh, simulations. So they correlate very well. Uh, we, have, we have not like uh, order of, of magnitude of difference, so they're pretty close to each other. But uh, as I say, that we have a slightly higher uh, viscosity and, um, and consistently a slightly uh, lower uh, self-diffusion coefficients. But the structural properties are exactly the same. So we have the same density uh, and radial distribution functions. So for the coarse grain model, 
which is the um, uh, light uh, blue, uh, uh, sorry, the, the dark blue uh, curve. Um, uh, uh, they are obtained by reverse mapping uh, the sphere into uh, the atomic structure and then computing um, the uh, contribution of hydrogen uh, atoms as well. Um, and since here we are interested in multi-scale simulations, I'm also showing you how to in increase the time step of simulation to access a longer time scale. So for um, time steps of one and 10 femtoseconds, we use the nominal mass of water, but if we want to use higher time steps, we need to use a slightly heavier version of water. So for 15 and 20, femtoseconds, uh, we have uh, just a slightly increase of mass. And just for fun, we tried also 40 and uh, ridiculous 80 femtosecond integrator. Um, so in all those simulations, if we compute the density while scaling the, um, uh, the density of uh, each particle to the nominal density, we see basically um, no big variation. It's roughly constant within the error bar and within um, the typical value for tip 3 p water. Um, uh, but um, as expected, we see an increase in density. But, in, in, well, what I would say is that uh, up to then 20 femtosecond um, uh, time step, uh, we have, we are still within the experimental range uh, of values for uh, water. So it's, um, um, so that means that we can slightly tune the properties of water and run these uh, accurate simulations uh, uh, with a large time step. And of course, if we use uh, even larger time step, we end up with a more, much more viscous liquid. So it may not be what we want uh, to use. Uh, we did the same uh, for uh, other solvents. So the, me the method is entirely uh, general. So we can uh, model any kind of uh, molecules with the MOLC model. Uh, so again, uh, same story here. Um, and uh, uh, you see here the comparison between the uh, density and co diffusion coefficients uh, computed uh, for the coarse grain, uh, which is this uh, triangle shape, but also for uh, an atomic model kept rigid. So that was to see, um, to compare um, uh, those the, the coarse grain simulations with uh, something with um, atomic resolution, but uh, where all the atoms are rigid. So you see for the density, they correlate pretty well. So they're almost uh, the same. Um, and the values are a bit uh, a, a more spread uh, for uh, the diffusion coefficients. But again, uh, we, we are, um, say, within a few percentage of error compared to the uh, all atom reference. And here, the radial distribution functions so the, um, uh, between the atomic reference and the uh, cross grain model. Uh, so you can see that they agree uh, pretty spectacularly. Um, another uh, application was for organic semiconductor. That, that was, um, so this is a, a library of uh, uh, whole transport molecules we studied uh, for um, this European project. Um, and uh, you see that we have some experimental measurements. Some of them are not exactly what we found uh, theoretically. So we can blame maybe the experimentalists uh, for that. But uh, um, well, without joking, but um, it's, uh, what, what is important is uh, that level of consistency between uh, the, the atomic reference and the coarse grain model. So that means that uh, we can really capture the diversity uh, of shapes and, and properties uh, that are entirely captured by the uh, cross grain model. So uh, this is another practical example of a multi-scale simulation. So that's a work um, about to be published with Gabriele Davino at uh, Institut Niel in Grenoble, France. And here uh, we computed the um, uh, amorphous samples of these two uh, semiconductors, Pyrotard and TCTA. Uh, doped with this FC, TCN, and Q molecule. Uh, and um, and we, we basically run a coarse grain simulations, then reverse map to the atomic structure, and finally computed um, electronic properties. So in this, um, this plot, you see the energy, uh, the distribution of energies for holes and electrons and the uh, thin lines are the atomic reference and the thick lines are um, the results uh, from 
uh, the um, uh, coarse grain multi-scale simulations. So you see uh, a small difference for, for the pristine uh, uh, dopant molecule, um, um, but otherwise a very good agreement between the results uh, from the two models in the case of doped uh, systems. And we also observe a shift of the position of these energy levels um, when we go from the pristine material to the doped material. So here we change uh, the um, electrostatic embedding um, and the medium. And uh, so that's reflected from the shift in these positions. Um, well, not only that, uh, here, um, just for fun, I computed the uh, crystal structure of uh, these three compounds um, with um, a, uh, the MOLC coarse grain model. And uh, you see um, a pretty good agreement. Uh, and uh, to my knowledge, that's something very hard to, uh, to do already using uh, atomic force field. So the, ver the fact that uh, we obtained that kind of agreement for, uh, with the coarse grain model is pretty uh, remarkable. And uh, um, so, yeah, uh, we were very happy by uh, uh, these findings. So uh, we used um, so um, um, uh, this model to uh, um, to study polymers. So we have three examples here: PLGA. It's a biodegradable uh, material, and uh, you see uh, the same um, same um, uh, molecules in two different configurations: an amorphous structure and a crystalline structure. Um, then another complex polymer, uh, uh, IDTBT. Uh, so this is the uh, repeating unit, and this is a small sample. And um, you saw in the previous slide P3HD, this is the monomer, and that's another, uh, so it's a larger sample with uh, longer polymer chains. So uh, still on P3HD, um, we have um, here uh, two uh, large uh, surfaces. Uh, um, um, I showed just the backbone uh, to highlight uh, the uh, order. Uh, in these uh, samples. So here we have a, a crystal face edge on, and here a more rough surface with uh, disconnected domains. Uh, so you see some order, uh, uh, lo local order, and some uh, disordered connecting regions. Uh, finally, last example, um, this is a, um, a playground model uh, where we um, uh, study the interaction well, the wettability of a P3HD surface uh, with many solvents, and we are developing a, um, a soft version of these potentials to, uh, up to use the free energy perturbation method. Uh, this is still work in progress, but uh, should be finished soon. And um, uh, here I want to highlight a cutout of the surface uh, um, and, uh, and the comparison with the um, uh, an actual AFM image uh, from this paper here. So you, you see a very good agreement. Uh, so those are on the same scales of 20 nanometers. See the same number of uh, uh, chains and spacing. So to conclude, um, I showed you a, um, uh, um, a uh, some examples of uh, uh, multi-scale simulations uh, where uh, the uh, cross-grain level of modeling has been uh, done with the MOLC model, which is a coarse grain force field based on spheroids. And it includes short and long range interactions plus directional bonds. So it has a number of advantages. And I would say the most important being it reproduces very accurately uh, the shape and excluded volume of molecules and therefore gives a very accurate uh, structural and morphological properties. So a huge shout out to Matteo Ricci. Uh, my, the co-founder of MaterialX with me and who did all the coding. And also I shall acknowledge uh, the contribution of Andrew Jewett, uh, the author of uh, Multimplate uh, for uh, helping us uh, implementing um, our model in uh, Multimplate. And also QDEC program for uh, incubating uh, the company and University of Bristol for uh, financial support uh, and you for your kind attention. Thank you so much. And thank you very much, uh, Otello, for this uh, wonderful talk. Now we have a few questions, and we have uh, we've been perfectly on time, so we have about five minutes. So let's start from Henry 
Brockner uh, from uh, National Facility. So impressive method, multi-scale study, two questions. One, is the back mapping CGAA done with the same simulation and what is the overhead? I'm gonna start with this question. Yes, um, no, it's not done. Um, it's done outside uh, the simulation. That's because, um, well, in principle, it could be done within the simulation, but um, uh, just for uh, testing purposes, we used a, um, um, a tool with, which is open source, is available uh, on the website. Oh, yes, I, I didn't mention that all the references and uh, software is available on the company website. Um, so you are free to try it out for yourself. Um, so yes, it's done externally. So we uh, basically stop the simulation, uh, select the frame where um, uh, you want to reintroduce the atomic structure uh, and, uh, and then you can uh, carry on with um, an atomic simulation. Perfect. There is a follow-up. Uh, how long is the relaxation time needed for the back mapping stage? Oh, that that's pretty um, instantaneous. So it's, um, well, it depends on the system, but um, sometimes uh, you can just go straight from, um, from the coarse grain structure to the atomic structure with, without relaxation. For uh, more, let's say, more uh, complex molecules, especially when you have alkyl chains, uh, you um, you also have a um, like ten or fifteen steps of uh, minimization uh, just to uh, resolve bad contacts, and um, and then you go straight at room temperature, and within few uh, picoseconds you are uh, back. Um, to an equilibrated structure. So the reason to do this step is to reintroduce um, thermal energy into the um, rigid sections of the molecules because each ellipsoid uh, I mean, is modeled around the uh, zero, zero Kelvin uh, structure, so the minimized uh, structure of that fragment. Um, so it does not have any uh, internal uh, thermal energy. So when we uh, uh, reverse map um, uh, the atomic structure if you want all the thermal energy is stored between um, the uh, connected fragments so we want to equilibrate even uh, so also the uh, internal part uh, of the fragment but yes it's done in few well say few uh, uh, nanoseconds at work in the last, in the worst cases perfect so there is a more of a comment than a question from Patrick here at University of Reading. Um, how would you compare, uh, uh, so artificially slow down the coarse grain dynamic, it does not seem right. Um, how does this compare to more Moritz-Zantic approach? Um, do you have any comment about this, Ms. Mo? Um, I'm not sure about, um was what 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 uh, does it mean about slowing down um um the the dynamics but um yeah i'm not um well um i'm i'm not aware of uh, this work so we may have a um maybe a, a follow up um discussion on that that's perfect i had a very quick question very quick question i have many questions um, normally, when I when I talk about multi-scale dynamics, I I, I think about um, making the same simulation, kind of multi-scale, uh, some some part of the system treated with um, ab initio and some other treated with uh, molecular dynamics, combining the two. Is it something that could work in uh, with your software to actually to have this kind of QMMM or similar kind of approach? yes yes that's that can be done. <clears throat> And um, um, it requires a bit of tinkering, uh, so it's not yet um, easy to do, uh, but in principle, you have exactly the same, um, um, the same terms um, in the simulation. So you have uh, basically, um, you can use a Lennard-John potential within the Gay-Bern potential. So um, it's, um, it's essentially the same uh, and uh, uh, you can, of course, uh, um, well, um, uh, mix the two um, the two uh, representations. And another idea uh, for a future development would be 
to have some sort of adaptive resolution where you um, partition the system depending on uh, the level you are uh, looking at it. And so you may have even a coarser representation that may be important for a solvent. So you have the extended effect um, in terms of electrostatics and you use larger um, uh, beads. So in the case of water, maybe spheres containing six to or more water mo molecules inside uh, and you increase the resolution close to let's say a protein uh, and then you increase the resolution even further around the active site and so all of that can be done within the same framework that's because uh, this uh, MLC uh, model uh, basically that's the same energy expression of type one force fields um, it lacks um, a, 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 angular and dihedral terms because those are included in this special two-body potential. But um, um, again, we can define other terms for uh, the atomic part. So yes, that's entirely feasible. Thank you so much. And uh, for the sake of time, we, we stop here for the question. We thank again the speaker for this excellent talk. And, thank you so uh, much. Now the um, next speaker is... Uh, um, Camilla Dimino from UCL and without any further ado I'll let Camilla start her presentation. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, thank you for being here. Um, I will share my presentation. I am a third year PhD student. Can, sorry Marco, can you say it? Yes, I can say it. Perfect. Thank you very much. Sorry. I'm a third year PhD student at UCL under the supervision of Mia's keeper, Andrea Sella and Andrew Seal. Um, I'm here to present the, my work, my general work on the intermolecular interaction in liquid samples, in particular studied by a Monte Carlo simulation combined with neutron diffraction. So I will give you a very brief, in, a very brief introduction to neutron, what neutron scattering is and why it's so important. So neutron scattering, as you may be acquainted with uh, X-ray scattering for crystals, and we're basically doing the same, but with a different probe. So what we're doing is studying, instead of crystal liquid samples, which are more disordered, uh, but still locally ordered, with, instead of um, X-rays, so photons, with neutrons. And the reason why we use neutrons is, first of all, because they are uncharged, so they are highly penetrating, and they interact with nuclei, so they're not highly dependent on the, the atomic species you, you're going to see, so how electron-rich is uh, your sample. So we can, instead of having the, some tricks to find more electron-rich elements in our sample, we can just study every kind of samples with um, the, the power of, of neutrons. So you can see also hydrogen and in particular deuterium. Um, and then we are sampling our, um, our different systems with wavelengths of the order and interatomic distances. And this is very useful because it's going to give us information about the, the, atomic, the local atomic structure of, of our sample. I mentioned that uh, neutron scattering is really good for hydrogen, but, in, but more importantly for deuterium, because the most important thing we do to study our system is isotopic substitution then. What it means, it means that instead of using just one single isotope of, of the, the species in the, in the sample, we tend to, uh, to isotopic substitute them in order to have different diffraction pattern, as you can see here, but they're all representative of the same system. Why we do that? So when we, we do a neutron diffraction experiment, we get out a total structure factor. This, this total structure factor would be a sum over alpha and beta of the partial structure factor, which contain all the structure information of our samples, species per species. In fact, alpha and beta are the species you find in your sample. And this is very important because alpha and beta can be the combination of all the species in your sample. And in here, there is all the structure information you need. 
weighted, weighted with the concentrations of the species you have in solution and uh, with the density of the sample. As Otello mentioned, we, we can get out a very important um, function, that is the G of R. Because once you get your partial structure factor for a neural experiment, when you Fourier transform them and you go from the Q space to the R space, you can get um, distances and literally the, the position, the atomic position from another atom chosen as an origin. So we're literally sitting on an atom, we're looking around, every time we find an atom of interest of species alpha or beta, then the GFR will have a peak. This is very important because we're going to put all the information from a neutron diffraction experiment into a Monte Carlo simulation. So normal Monte Carlo simulation, as you probably know, so normal Monte Carlo simulation just work moving uh, under atoms and molecules in, in the space, so with rotation and translation, to try and minimize the energy. So every time you get a move that will give you a lower energy, then the move is always accepted. When the energy is greater, then the, the, the move will be accepted, weighted with the, uh, with the Boltzmann factor. So the point is, we're going to build a simulation box in which there are all the information of the system we studied with neutron diffraction. So there will be the same concentration, same density and same atomic species of our neutron diffraction experiment. And we use it as an input for a Monte Carlo simulation. So the first thousand step of my simulation is a pure Monte Carlo, which uses a 12-6 Lennard-Jones potential plus a Coulombic term when it's necessary, when, when of course it's of interest using um, a Coulombic term. At the same time, instead of putting just an interatomic potential in my simulation, I also constrain the simulation with the neutron data. So what the program does is iteratively compare the simulated structure factor and the measure structure factor to calculate the new potential. So to make the, the, new, poten the, inter the new intermolecular potential as similar as possible to the neutron diffraction data. So once you calculated the difference between the two data and the new potential, we don't have just a Leonard Jones and a Coulombic potential, but we have the same inter intermolecular potential. So an initial potential defined like this one, plus an empirical potential. So the difference between the normal Monte Carlo and what we do is we don't just move molecules, we move molecules and at the same time we refine on top of that the potential to have the best agreement with the neutron diffraction data. And this makes the simulation, hopefully, the most reasonable and the most, uh, the most structurally correct possible. So APSI has been developed in 1996 by Alan Sopo and it's, it's a program developed for water. Genuinely, he, he started uh, with water and to try to refine in the best way possible the structure of water in, the, in every condition. And then it, this has been expanded, but we've always been in the area of small molecules. So we've always done water, water um, interaction, water ethanol interaction, water methanol interaction is a paper that went in nature because they observed the segregation of methanol in water solutions. Uh, more recently, they study azeotropic mixtures, but in azeotropic mixture, they studied acetone and chloroform. So we're always in the range of small molecules. Some of our work involves also the weak hydrogen bonding between olefin and methanol. So still very, very weak interaction, very different from the strong hydrogen bonding that Alan uh, studied with water alcohol solutions, but still in the range of small molecules because we work with very, very few atoms. But what we decided to do is extending this method. This try was a kind of a gamble. It's extended to very complex systems. And it's there that we're starting applying neutron diffraction and Monte Carlo simulation for nanomaterial solutions. So nanomaterials are very important, especially in the field of new devices and functional materials. And uh, what we do is putting carbon and nanotubes negatively charged into DMS solutions. So this is a work of, this is um, Nils Kiefer, my supervisor, Milo Schaffer uh, at Imperial College, 
uh, work on uh, methyl ammonia solutions. So meth methyl ammonia is a, is a really good solution to reduce carbon nanotubes. So what they notice is with this scalable method of reducing carbon nanotubes in a room and um, a room and temperature, no, sorry, room pressure and temperature, it was very scalable and it was substantially easier than mechanically do that to separate carbon nanomaterials. So they essentially put carbon nanotubes, um, sodium and ammon in liquid ammonia, and they, they managed to reduce the carbon nanotubes. And they noticed that once they removed the ammonia left, the salt they obtained was completely dissolved in the amount. And this is not a dispersion. This is, a, this is genuinely a solution because that is stable for long term, for long time. So once we got our system, we did our neutron diffraction experiment and we made a simulation box. So our simulation box, instead of being a simulation box of few small molecules, now is a simulation box which has intermediate this huge carbon nanotube with, surrounded by 3000 EMF molecules, 51 sodium and 61 ammonia molecules. The ratio is a stoichiometric ratio and it depends how we, we made the experiment I've discussed it here. So once this simulation is very computationally expensive for this program, but we managed, first of all, we noticed that the sample still looks like bulk DMF, apart from a small contribution, a contribution as more Q, the small Q range that is the long range in, in the R space, in which we can see the influence of the carbon nanotube. Why this is important? This is important because we have, in our neutron scattering pattern, both the contribution of the carbon nanotubes, because we know they're there, plus um, the structure of QDMF. So we know that the carbon nanotube is dispersed. So once we've done that, we can divide our simulation box in different solvation shells, because this is what we're interested in. We want to see what is the behavior of DMF, of the counter ions around a charged interface because this is of incredible interest for the, for, for the development on new devices and, for, um, and, and to see if the, the nature, the intrinsic nature of this interaction can be useful as um, a base for developing on supercapacitors. So once we've divided the area around the nanotube in different shells, we can see that the DMF is very structured up to more than 20 angstrom. And this is a very big thing, because when we deal with small molecules, we cannot see that far because we're still working with liquid systems. So the carbon nanotube is disrupting the, the, the orientation and the, of the solvent around it up to 22, 23 angstrom. And what we can see, as soon as we compare in the first convention shell the structure of DMF with the, the, the structure of bulk DMF, so DMF sees itself in a much more sharp way than it does in bulk solution. So it means that the influence of the carbon nanotube is very, very big in terms of structure of DMF. And I would like to point out how important it is having a picture of this huge system and we, we, are, we are able to have an atomistic picture of what is going on in the first 7, 10, 20 angstrom. Once we, we go in the bulk, so we go in the yellow region far away from the nanotube where we assume there is no, um, there is no or little influence from uh, the carbon nanotube, we see that the more, more, more or less the DMF-DMF structure is more or less the same of the bulk DMF. Apart from a small shift, we can see that it's probably due to the volume for the, um, the excluded volume effect because carbon nanotubes in solution are quite big, so they occupy space. The power of this program, the power of this method, is trying to see not only in two dimensions, but also in three dimensions, having a picture of what is going on in our system. So what we do is extending the analysis from two dimensions that are the G of us to three dimensions. There are the angular distribution functions and the spatial distribution functions. What is very interesting when you consider the, the X axis that is defined in this way, so is an N oxygen axis in the DMF molecule, you see that 
the x axis finds another molecule, another x axis and another DMF molecule around zero. This means that at that point in our samples, all the, all the DMF molecules are, are aligned. And this is happening in the first observation shell, because you can see here that it's very localized, is less localized in the second and third observation shell, and is almost not localized at all in the third observation shell. You can see just a spot, a black spot here, which indicates the preference of the DMF molecules of orient themselves with dipole interactions. So the same, you can see the same is happening here because you have a comp while in the total back DMF, DMF you can find DMF molecules isotropically around the, or the, the original DMF molecules you're considering as an origin. In the first solvation shell, so in the, the solvation shell of the carbon nanotube, you see that the DMF molecules cannot, cannot be positioned and oriented in any way because there is a carbon nanotube here. And that is conditioning all the interaction between DMF molecules and between DMF sodium atoms. Why well, I'm talking about sodium atoms? Because sodium atoms, the counter ions, is what um, supercapacitor people, energy people are interested in. So the role of counter ions is very important for this kind of materials. And what we can see in our system is that in the first solvation shell, so locally around the nanotube, the sodium is too busy solvating the nanotube and the DMF is too busy solvating the nanotube so much that you don't see almost at all a DMF sodium interaction. You start seeing a DMF sodium interaction which is incredibly localized and sharp in the box system. In fact, because of electronegativity, the sodium is going to position itself around the oxygen atom of the DMF molecule. So in conclusion, we extended the PSR method to complex system. And that was, that was a challenge. And we managed to do that with a, on a reasonable fit. When in solution, we see the negatively charged carbon nanotube disrupt the structure, the structure of the solvent. And it disrupted up to 20 angstrom. And for the first time, we're able to see so far in a liquid system. And then, of course, the structural orientation of the solvent and the counter ions is of fundamental interest for new devices. So what we're planning to do, and we already got neutron diffraction data, is increasing the concentration and see if, so the experiment has been done at 25 milligram per milliliter, which is actually a very high concentration for this kind of systems, but we're happy because we can see, still see the, the structure of the MF in the neutron diffraction pattern. We want to try and increase the, the concentration and challenge this, the, this kind of program more and try to model something like two nanotubes in a box, ideally perpendicular or on any other orientation. And then trying with different solvents and see what it will be the interaction between carbon nanotube and DMAC and NMP in particular because they are the main solvents for nanomaterial dissolutions. And I don't know the timing, but I'm done. So thank you very much for listening. I would like to thank my supervisors and all the people I'm working with. And of course, APSRC for funding this project. Thank you very much. You've been perfectly on time. And I'm sure there's, there's going to be some question. Yes, uh, from Otello uh, Roshoni. Is the carbon nanotube uh, chopped? Or periodic in the simulation that you've shown today? It's periodic. So it's because periodic. of periodic boundary condition, we bonded the nanotube to itself in order not to have any gap in our periodic conditions. So, um, any other question? Yeah. Um, okay, there are no other other questions. Uh, uh, in the in the conversation, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you something. Actually, I'm, I'm working on I'm on uh, nanotubes and uh, uh, graphene myself, and we're looking at defects. Do you think that defects and edges? I mean, maybe maybe it is what uh, Otello was mentioning before. Is this something that potentially could be included in this kind of um, simulations, so it, or maybe too much? Yes. It can be. I'm working actually to include defects. All right. It's very difficult. 
And yeah. it's more obvious because every every system has its own defect. Yeah. So we tend to ignore it to have a, a kind of an ideal system to work with because we're not interested in the, the interface, but in the structure disruption of the solvent and the ions. Yeah, around. yeah. But in general, it's a very good idea. And yeah. we would like to try to do some XPS measurements first and then mm -hmm. try to model the CH, COH, and uh, all the possible impurities that there could be in the carbon. Yeah, that would be incredibly, incredibly nice uh, uh, outlook. So, um, yeah, yeah. Thank, um, I think for the sake of time, I don't see any any more questions. But uh, yeah, for the for the sake of time, let's thank again um, uh, Camilla and all the speakers of this session. Thank you much for thank you very much for your talks. And 